on our land. Um, welcome to January's Green Step Cities workshop here in the lovely um, warm and 70 sunny uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I don't know how it is out in the rest of Minnesota, but it's it's like we're baking in here. Um, not really. Um, so you're here to hear finally about the launch of Step 4. Um, we're very, very excited. This has been uh, many years in the making. And um, I'm Diana McEwen. I um, direct the metro region of CERT clean energy resource teams based at the Great Plains Institute. And I also happen to um, have fallen into the job of coordinating these Green Step Cities workshops um, over the years and um, often um, play MC. And I'm happy to be here today and want to give big, big, big thanks to our series sponsor for the workshop series this year, Excel Energy, who's been a great partner the last couple of years supporting these um, workshops. And um, also um, Orange Environmental today is our, our workshop sponsor, so we're really happy to have Michael and Orange Environmental um, doing lots of great stuff with local governments for lots of years. Um, what a great resource, so happy to have um, them as a sponsor today. So um, we're get started. I just um, I want to remind people that you can register for the rest of the workshops. They're the second Tuesday of every month right here. You can do it by webinar. You can do it in person. In person you will get snacks and they're good snacks. Um, right? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, for those on the webinar, we're happy to have you join. We're really excited that we were able to expand this year to, have, to the webinar so that more people across the state could participate in these workshops. And i um, so happy to have all of you online. And Patrick um, will be running the webinar. And if you have questions, you can ask them. And he will help um, kind of put them to the presenters today. Um, and so with that, um, I believe I will introduce Abby Finnis, my colleague and friend from the Great Plains Institute um, and co-director of the Green Step Cities program, who will um, run the show. Um, we shuffled, is it okay if I stand here? I think I'm still in the, yeah. in the camera. Uh, we shuffled the agenda a little bit and I'm going to go first. As Diana said, I'm her colleague and friend at the Great Plains Institute and uh, co-director of the Green Step Cities Program. Um, so yeah, thank you guys all for coming out today. Your car started, you made it, you didn't, and you're online. Um, I wanted to take a, a sort of uh, taken aside yesterday, I guess. Um, I'm not really a big fan of David Bowie. Um, I know some of his songs. I know that's a shock. Uh, I haven't been. You know, I know his songs and I love the Labyrinth, but I'm not really Mary Lucia. Uh, <laughs> if you know her, she's kind of she's obsessed with him. Um, so yesterday with his passing, um, it was sort of interesting because I read you know articles that people posted and watched some of the videos, and it dawned on me that I've been missing out. And he is truly kind of a remarkable artist and a remarkable person in that he had this sort of sense of looking to the future and seeing what was coming and, and sort of being that, that artist that pushes the envelope and, and gets us to the next thing. And, and I think that we're really fortunate to have him as an artist or have had him as an artist and have artists like that who sort of look ahead and push us. And if we don't have them, then we're kind of listening to the same old thing on the juice box. And so I'm going to make kind of an awkward transition into Patrick or stuff for uh, And as, as, you know, kind of thinking in this whole context and thinking about Green Step City and where it's been and where it's going and, and how we got to, you know, deciding metrics, I started my involvement with Green Step Cities in about 2010, and there was a lot of conversation back then about, well, do we do metrics? Do we measure, you know, what people are doing? What if we do that and we don't show that it's we don't show that we're having an impact. Does that mean that the program is a failure? Um, and so there's kind of fear around going down that, that line. But as the program has grown, it's become really quite clear that that's where we need to go um, in metrics. And, and even if it's demonstrating that we're not doing what we think we're doing, then at least we know that and we can correct it and we can start um, measuring impact and, and getting on the right course. And, um, Green Step Cities is really kind of alone in this field. Uh, our peer programs throughout the country aren't really doing anything like this. And so we are kind of embarking on new territory in Minnesota with this. And it's going to be a little bit of, um, of 
a challenge going forward, and, and we really appreciate you know all the work that's gone into developing set four metrics with Mike Warren. It's been a huge, huge help um, in developing this metric. Philip has done a lot of work of late, um, and then of course a big thanks to the pilot city to walk through the data and, and help to get us to where we are. Um, so I'm going to sort of talk about where we are a little bit today, and then we'll move forward into set four metrics. But do you have to? Have I'll try. Oh, okay. Um, so to start, uh, metrics are going to sort of live in a different place than a lot of other things have lived just due to some technical capacity and some changes with the website. Um, so to find the Green Step 4 measures, you're going to go to the home page, click on Become a Green Step City. Um, and that will eventually get you to here. Uh, so scroll down to the bottom of that page and you'll get to Green Subsidy 4 and click on this link, which is going to go to the Great Plains Institute website, um, which you won't, you won't be any the wiser. Uh, you'll just go to a new page. Um, and that's where the metrics are going to live. You'll be able to scroll through that and um, identify the metrics that you'll want to, to look at and proceed with, um, and Philip is going to get into more detail about what those are <coughs> later. Um, but basically the process is going to be, you go to the website, you download your sheet for your guidance, you get the spreadsheet, um, you're going to fill that out and then send it back to the Great Plains Institute and we'll sort of be the, the intake person. Um, and we can provide resources for data if you need assistance with that, because um, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge getting everybody to uh, the data, you know, Metro has access to more data than, than Greater Minnesota might have, um, and there will just sort of be those uh, steps in the middle of figuring all that out. Um, and then we'll kind of do analysis of who's doing what um, and how they're doing it and how they're achieving it and those sorts of things and kind of continue to fine tune the program as we go along, um, and that's improvement. And we're going to really need feedback from participating cities, um, and then we'll continue to kind of take that and sort it out and design the program and make it a little bit easier and, and um, uh, demonstrate our progress. Um, so in April, I think, is kind of the deadline to get your, your metrics in. May, uh, May 1st. May 1st. May 1st. Uh, so you'll get your, that's your deadline to get your metrics reported and then in June we have the annual kind of recognition and we'll recognize that four cities at that time. Um, and then there's going to be a number of metrics that are optional that you can choose to, to do um, based on whatever your city's interests are. And then there's some that are core, which will kind of require you to do uh, to achieve step four. And then that's all going to be for the prior prior year. Um, so I think now we're going to, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the pilot cities. Are you, if you're a pilot city, we've got one, we've got two. Sort of. <laughs> um, so uh, to kind of share their experience uh, with the pilot program. So Kristen, do you want to maybe start? Do I get to sit here? Do we? Is it better? Yeah, you can get here. Get if you can yeah. go up. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So uh, I'm Kristen Moreau, City of Elk River. Um, we somewhat, maybe stupidly, volunteered to be a pilot program or a pilot city for Step 4, um, not really knowing what we were getting ourselves into. Um, but um, I, I must say, um, it, I think it turned out pretty well. Um, we really enjoyed um, finding all the metrics, and I think that Phil's going to go through um, all those metrics will be a bit later, right? So maybe what I'm saying, I guess, will, will be a little out of character with for those of you not and um, that don't know what those metrics really are at this point. Um, but unlike step one through three, step four is really looking at measurements. Um, so you're finding data um, and and measuring where your city is at um, on a whole list of when you first see the list. We were we were really overwhelmed. Um, it looked impossible, especially when you say the May 1st deadline from today is kind of a scary um, thing to think about, but we made it. 
um, a lot of the metrics, they've done a really good job um, finding ones that, that are really easy to find online or through other resources. Um, there's things on there that made no sense to me, but once you find that right person, they just know it off the top of their head. So it's really not too much work other than finding the right people in your community, at your county, um, who have those answers. A couple things that involve a little bit more digging, a little bit more work, um, but overall, um, the timeline works, but you definitely have to be on top of it for the next couple of months if you want to get through it. Um, but, and then um, I think the biggest thing that I learned from doing the pilot is once you find out who you need to talk to to get the answers, um, if it's not yourself, make sure that those people know that, that they're going to have to come up with those same answers next year. So that they're aware of keeping track of things that maybe they haven't been keeping track of in the past, um, so that, that those answers are, are quicker to get. Um, so I think that's kind of one of the challenges to keep people on top of things that aren't involved with Green Step Cities, um, who don't really understand what the program is. But here you are asking them for, for some answers. Any other? What do you see as sort of the biggest benefit for doing metrics? Um, so definitely when you look at what step five is going to be, um, which is kind of, I guess I'm wrong, but um, <laughs> taking those metrics and creating goals for yourself as a community, um, actually taking the time to figure out where you stand after doing all the work through steps one through three on a number of different topics, um, really helps, especially our city council, um, who can actually see those numbers. Like, this is where we're at, this is where we compare to with our community. This isn't a competition, but it's interesting to, to look at the same community size and, and see what we're we'll coming together as a place. So, yeah, that's what we um, But, it's easier to communicate with numbers sometimes rather than say, we're step three city. Come here, council members, staff, community, um, residents don't really understand what that means and what it entails to get to this point. Um, so it's just an extra little tool to use for everyone. Um, was there any kind of surprise metrics that stood out? Um, for us, I think the hardest was looking at our greenhouse gas consumption, um, and we didn't really finish it. <laughs> um, we're not a huge city, Yellow River is 23,000 people, um, don't necessarily have all the staff in, needed in order to look at greenhouse gas emissions and, and do all that mathematical equation stuff, um, or the expertise, so that was one that we kind of failed on. Um, and, and I don't know if things have changed since, since we did the pilot program or not. Um, but that's definitely a working area, which is something we need to be doing anyway. Um, but definitely something we need to protect. Um, so did you want to come up to join us up here? <laughs> is uh, is Eden Prairie now? Does anybody have questions for Kristen? What was the thing that was easier than you thought it would be? The timeline, honestly. Um, I think when you look at the list of metrics that you're supposed to go through, like I said, it is really overwhelming. Um, but when you really start breaking it down, once you think about who you need to talk to, um, it's a lot of the information that was requested is really easy to obtain. Um, there's just a few things that really took some more time, maybe because our staff wasn't recording those things in previous years, but they're easy things to be recording. Um, so maybe that took some time going through previous plans or documents or whatever. Um, but the information's there. It's just a matter of gathering it. So you're like a detective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, were there were there um, things you were measuring where staff said, 
oh, but we're measuring something slightly different, or we really want to measure this. Did you run into that? Some, a little yeah. bit sometimes? A lot? Yeah, um, a little bit. Um, most of it, most of the metrics are flexible enough, I think, that you could use a slightly different answer than, um, and I think as Pilot City, we saw a lot of differences, too, between communities and how yeah. you might measure something compared to another community, but you still kind of get that same answer. And I think going through the whole pilot program, one of the big things that, that you guys talked about repeatedly is this isn't a competition between communities. It's looking at you on an annual basis. So you're really comparing your data to yourself in the previous year. So as long as you're consistent with that, that's what's important out of this. Um, and then when you're looking at other communities, you just need to keep in mind that they might be measuring a little bit differently. Uh, I think we'll transition to um, Fresno. Uh, so Steve asked us here to talk about her. Thanks, Kristen. I want to be okay. So anyway. <laughs> You're on that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> hey, hi. I'm Sue Bass with City of Burnsville. Did you get the coding? Um, okay. And so I am not a pilot city. I didn't do all the uh, different metrics. Uh, what I did was I picked a few and then um, I have been doing sustainability updates for the last five, six years, and um, the first few years I did narratives, and um, basically I was the only one that read them. <laughs> so I, fear, I was trying to figure out ways to um, take the information that the sustainability indicators, the metrics, how do I communicate that to councils, commissions, and the public? And so the last couple of years, I've um, used these metrics and tried to um, do more graph-like kinds of um, uh, documents. And basically, I know this is a lot of paper. This is really meant to be on the web. And it is on City of Burnsville's website uh, on the sustainability page. But I could figure out how to make smaller copies. So if you don't want these, you can have them if you want them. If you don't want them, just put them on the back table, and I'll use them again instead of throwing away all this paper or recycling all this paper. So um, yeah, so the metrics, I know I went, um, well, we'll start with the, the 20, what is it, 2013. You know, it's always a year behind. So 2013 sustainability report. Some of the graphics I thought are great. Some of them are hard. Some of the information is harder to put into graphic form. Um, I think the aquifer, this one about the aquifer on the back of the sustainability report, this really you can see very clearly when we started our program um, uh, how, and how it changed. I think this is a really nice graphic that shows, oh yeah, wow, that really makes a difference in, in what we were doing. We diverted, we were pump, uh, Kramers was pumping millions of gallons of water per day into the Mississippi River. And we used that as uh, drinking water instead. So you can really see how that changed the aquifer. Another uh, graph that I think is, that really works well Michael Orange helped, helped with the greenhouse gas inventory. I know what you, I just didn't even bother trying to do that myself. Very, very difficult. So, Michael, thank you. And I think this graph works really well. Um, when I started this, I didn't realize that um, our city, the major energy use was pumping water. And so that was a big surprise to me. And you can certainly, the purple is water. And you can certainly see that and by um, using uh, high um, energy efficient pumps, you can see definitely see how that influenced um, our energy use. So these graphs were really helpful. And um, so the next, last year after looking at some of the things that were going to be required, um, LED lights, so I worked on that, and in the back I worked on um, the um, urban forestry 
some of the water information and um, protected land. So um, just trying to get those, uh, find the information, and then trying to do that um, in a graph form that can be easily communicated to public and um, councils and commissions. Um, one of the things that I think would would have helped, like particularly protected land, is like, well, is there a standard? And I don't know if that's coming or, you know, okay, so what does this mean? Is, are we doing well? Or are we doing um, above average, below average? So that would help if I knew um, the standard and could compare that, compare that to whatever um, we should be doing or if we're above and beyond. So. Um, that's my experience, and so I took easy ones that I thought I could get the information, and um, it was pretty much painless for the ones that I did do. So that was my my quest was to be able to uh, portray those on um, graphics. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put you on the spot. One of the things that uh, the Green Subsidy Steering Committee has been trying to grapple with is this but for question. But for green subsidies, would you have done? Um, so I'm wondering, you know, Burnsville has done a lot around sustainability prior to green subsidies. So you were kind of already down this road and you're a leader in that area. Um, are there things that the program has pushed you to do? Um, and what are those things? And where do you see it, it going? Um, well, I know the greenhouse gas inventory pushed us, but that was really part of the sustainability. But we, I know with that, we saw with the measurements where we fell down and so, or where we were needing to um, move forward a little bit and um, did that, um, especially in those high energy pumps. I mean, it was so graphically it could, uh, we could see the changes. So I think, especially with um, some of the metrics that we have, I mean, that's pretty obvious to me that we'll see where we need to work and then use that to move forward. I think, yeah, that particularly metrics and having those metrics, you know, pushing us to find the metrics, look forward. <laughs> Sue, I'm, I'm so pleasantly surprised um, by the fact that I, I did the uh, carbon baseline assessment for your citywide and city operations and gave you uh, three base years for your citywide operation. Um, and I'm looking at an additional four more years on your chart. Did you do the work? Uh, no. Uh, for the greenhouse gas for inventory? For citywide. Oh, for citywide. Um, no. Yes, this was the um, um, RII, Regional Indicators Initiative. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. okay, sorry. Yes. I was going to say that I have tried to train others to do the citywide. No, Michael, you'll Fall never down. train. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a hopeless, hopeless, uh, <laughs> any kind of a trim there. So yeah, um, Regional Indicators Initiative, we did participate in that. Great. <laughs> Are there any other questions for <coughs> So this question, so you, you pointed out uh, this question of protected land uh, uh, compared to total acres within the city, and, and it's, it's just one of those definitional issues. What do we... What do we want to measure? In terms of, is it open land? Is it public land? Public accessible? Is it protected land? As you were talking to people within the city, and maybe it was your your planning department or your GIS department or your parks department, did you find they were measuring one thing and not another thing? For example, were they measuring purely park space or? No, I think there was some kind of definition in there. Um, it was lakes. Yeah. And parks, and I think it added boulevards, but we did not 
have any information about acreage and so on. So we did not put that in there. Um, but we used the lake. That was very that was acceptable lake acreage, and then park acreage that was accessible too. So those are the two things that we put in there. Yeah, and I I don't know if there's another other definitions. I know I tried to look at trust for public lands because I wanted to find that standard, and I think yeah. that was like at 20 percent. But I I wasn't sure if our definition was the same as theirs, and I didn't want to use that just in case. So just yeah, I mean I think it's a really good example of where we were thinking coming out of the pilot program, the work that Michael had done in, in a guidance document was fine, sufficient, but we're, what we have found is that we need to spend more time defining, and then frankly, de uh, de defining what we feel is a, a standard. So we, we, we were just talking about the Trust for Public Land yeah. in, in, in the, the Twin Cities. So we have a definition, but we also realize there, in terms of open space, permeable land, there are two or three other common, at least as we look around the country, cities that are measuring a couple options. So I think in the guidance documents for each of the measures, we'll have, here's what we think everyone should measure, but really Green Step is, is about cities and cities work, you know, sort of um, accelerating their own efforts. And so if your city measures something, you know, if you don't measure boulevards, uh, acreage, I don't think we're going to, you know, yeah. squeeze you to do that. We want you to measure what resonates to you. And if that works for us. I mean, yeah. We have two more questions. One back to you, then, sorry, he's had his hand. Oh, sorry, little uh, Rob. I do. Hi. I'm going to take you in a greenhouse gas direction. Oh, no. You said that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, you said the, uh, it was a, a surprise how much the, the, the water and sewer system uh, used. How did you gain 30% efficiency? in the water sewer between 2009 and 2011. Is that just the Kramer Quarry and, and finding that efficiency with... So, no, the Kramer Quarry was the aquifer thing. Okay. Um, the efficiency for the um, pumping water, uh, it was a combination of a number of things, but mainly it was the, the high efficiency pumps. We changed to variable frequency drive pumps and other high efficiency pumps. And I think I asked you this question once before, but didn't your water treatment plant go online between 2009 and 2011? I mean, Possibly. I can't quite remember. The big efficiency I see there is, you know, Kramer was already pumping groundwater up to a certain level. You were pumping groundwater to a certain <coughs> level as well. And then you took your source offline and started grabbing their water at the surface. So no longer did you have to lift that water that far. It could have been... Partly that too. I would need to talk to Linda, the water specialist. But um, it was a surprise to me because when I think about high efficiency pumps and variable frequency drives, generally the efficiencies are a lot smaller than 30 percent. So um, yes, and there was um, a number of other things that were, that happened at that time too. That um, uh, changing from uh, you know, there's several pumps in the city and they were going uh, on and off to oh, because of, yeah, right. D diameter of pipes, I know they can give you a 5% bump maybe. Um, ductile iron. Pipes, um, okay. I know they were. I'm just going to tell me, sir, Burnsville's made 30%, you better make 30%. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to jump to the last question, we can get you Patty Orga at Cross Lake, and I'm just getting into the Minnesota uh, Green Step uh, process here. But So I just wanted to clarify something. So right now there is not a given standard for how much protected land there should be in a community? Correct. Okay. Because I come from an area where we have lots of lakes and forests. And so that's our economy, basically. And so protecting that is very important. Right. So. I wanted to know if there was some guidelines or how much we had to set aside for parks or whatever. And right now there's not any of what I understand. No, I, w I would say what, what we've been finding is that the, the state of Minnesota has a few um, has a few goals, such as the Next Generation Energy Act, 
but they they have not uh, sort of filtered down to the city level, and so the state, other than the significant regulatory requirements, which are I would consider just sort of baseline for um, environmental standards in the area of these broad areas that Green Step handles. Um, no, there are some national standards, but the danger with national standards is that it's not Minnesota, and we I think in Minnesota have unique culture, geography, geology. So um, for most of the the metrics, we're saying there are no, and we're not establishing at this point any sort of number you have to hit. But in the in the guidance documents, we're pulling out where we can find them some. Um, um, sort of observations based on evidence. I think we have to get to you, Perry. Uh, thank you so much, Sue. Uh, in Perry is in the house now. Tanya, would you like to come up and give an overview of uh, your experience with the pilot? Hey, my name is Tanya. I'm with the city of Union Prairie, and I plan to just give a brief overview of our experience with the program. Um, I think overall we had a really good experience. Um, what was really helpful for us was when we were first given the guidance document, all the different metrics. Um, we went through and kind of identified which departments and which divisions we thought would be the most appropriate to um, provide the information. And we set up a core group of staff um, that we had weekly meetings to go over the metrics and um, you know, if people had questions, um, you know, we would reach out to the Green Steps um, team who you know, were really helpful throughout the process in answering any questions about reporting the metrics. So I think that system was really helpful to kind of keep us on track and, and um, you know, keep um, you know, any questions that we had about the metrics reporting um, um, so we didn't have to, to rush too much at the last minute to get the information in. So that, that was really that was really helpful. Um, you know, the group was really kind of committed to the program and, um, you know, up front. So, it, you know, overall it went pretty smoothly for us. Um, you know, the guidance document was really helpful that was provided. Um, some of the, the things that we struggled with a bit was just um, kind of the formatting of some of the information. Um, you know, it's hard for us to kind of get all the information in the spreadsheet format given some of the larger tables and things that were associated with the document. So um, just kind of some of the logistical, um, actually submitting the information, we kind of submitted it, um, you know, as different pages rather than all in the spreadsheet. So I understand that that's going to be something that's going to be kind of tweaked a bit with the once the step four program officially rolls out. Um, you know, we're really excited about, um, you know, the, the metrics and everything. We're going to be using it. We're um, currently finishing up a um, what's called our, our 2040-15 program that mainly focused on energy and fuel reduction um, in city operations. And um, that program is wrapping up here. So we're planning for our successor program to our 2040-15 program that we're going to be rolling out in 2016. So I think a lot of these um, green step metrics are really going to feed into that, uh, that information and hopefully help them kind of shape what that program is going to look like. So we're really excited about that. Um, yeah, just overall good experience. Very positive. Um, were there any surprises over the mm -hmm. I don't think there was any real specific surprises. I mean, pretty much any questions we have were answered. I mean, I think something was really helpful. Um, you know, when we tried to kind of get too much in the weeds, that you know, the Green Step City team would kind of remind us that this is really to compare ourselves to ourselves. So we should really report what was what is helpful for us. Um, and not get too much into the week. The group helped you get out of the week? Yes. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, yeah. Could you give a little bit of background about 2040? I've heard you set goals a long time ago and have been steadily working for them. Uh, how, did, how did that work? Yeah, so basically we set goals um, of reducing fuel consumption and energy <laughs> consumption in our city operations, so you know, with our fleet and with our buildings. So we set targets. Um, Back in, I think the program started in 2006 and it's wrapping up into 15. And I understand we exceeded our goal um, of a 40% reduction in, I believe it was the energy usage, and I believe we just found out that we exceeded that goal. So we, we set a, a number of goals um, related to city operations of fuel and energy, um, and we set a time frame for them, and that was 2015. So uh, we're just wrapping up that program now. Any other questions? Other questions? Yeah. Well, just <laughs> again, just having sort of been uh, thinking about this one also. So, 
a couple a couple cities I talked to have a large enough diesel fleet for moving equipment, sweeps and so forth, that they were tracking miles per gallon for their diesel fleet, miles per gallon for their gas fleet or hybrid fleet. But you all I think you all just had one miles per gallon. Is that because you had few diesel? I believe so. I'd have to check with our fleet division, but I, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, yeah. yeah, I think that's one of you know, one of these situations where I think what the guidance is going to say, actually it doesn't right now, but we're saying diesel fleet miles per gallon, track that, track for gas. But I think for you it's worked very well just to have one miles per gallon per fleet. So yeah, that's, that's what you should do. I don't think I think the program should force you to break it out if, if it doesn't make sense for your. So. Um, I kept Kristen up here and Sue snuck away, but uh, <laughs> are there any questions for the, the three cities at large? Laura, you had a question earlier. Oh, well, it's just um, on the uh, building energy conservation measures. Um, I mean, this is more about showing progress and stuff, but um, I was going to say, when talking about annual savings, the annual savings are kind of reflected um, for in one year for what they achieved in that one year, but that carries over for a number of years. So it really, it, another way to show it is to add that savings from one year and the savings for the next year, as well as the new savings that carry that forward for whatever, like the expected life, usually, like, I don't know, whatever the particular um, retrofit was that was done, and that, that would, you know, be a better um, measure of what that is. I probably should have graphed that there, but in the narrative, the narrative it says projected per year cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's put that way when you focus on yeah. the, the graphing. Right. Yeah. 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 I think that's one thing that's going to come out of the metrics as we go along, and there's all sorts of cool ways that you can do infographics and stuff. And so the better that we can visually represent this data, the more impact I think that it will have in the long run. Um, if there aren't any more questions, I think we need to give a huge thank you to these pilot communities. <laughs> they made it a lot easier for the rest. So thank you guys. Um, Patrick, do you want to switch to Michael? So up next we have Michael Orange of uh, Orange Environmental. Um, who has really laid the groundwork for this. He's been doing um, this kind of metrics work for a long time, and, and it's really it's really starting to gain traction in Minnesota and take root. Um, we're very fortunate to have Michael Orange, uh, and he's going to sort of talk through the importance of metrics and, and all of his wisdom. So thank you. I'm going to jump in for one second. Normally we have a hashtag on the agenda in other places, but for those of you tweeters who are up here tweeting and taking <laughs> pictures, hashtag Green Step. WKSHP. So um, you can follow Green Steps on Twitter, on, on people on the webinar. Go ahead and follow us, share some information, share your thoughts and insights, questions you might have. Let's have a dialogue. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. And uh, thanks for inviting me today. I really appreciate that. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with Bill and Abby, Sarah, uh, Diane, and others on the, on the Green Step Cities program and especially trying to roll out Step 4. Um, you're not going to find uh, people who bring more expertise and dedication and enthusiasm uh, to their jobs than these people. Uh, we are, we're all very fortunate to have all of you great people. So let me see if I can um, excite you about greenhouse gas carbon <laughs> um, It's kind of a buzzkill at a party, but... Um, <laughs> No, it's the post Paris agenda. Okay, is there a better trip than the. I think it's the. Is there a lag time? I'll try it. There we go. Here we go. All right, what I'd like to cover are basically five questions. What are they? What's the carbon baseline assessment? Um, and there's already been some discussion about the difference between best practices versus metrics. I want to revisit that a little bit. Um, and my subtitle is. Uh, the, it's the environmental equivalent of your city budget, and I want to defend that rather than really. Um, and then, uh, can we change the world? And in fact, we have to change the world. Can we do that? And then uh, finally, what are some of the steps for implementation? 
So let's go to the first one. Uh, what are they? And uh, basically, a carbon baseline assessment is a compendium of all the greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted uh, within either uh, your city or your city operations. And in terms of most of that is going to be carbon, but there are also uh, methane and uh, nitrous oxide. Uh, other greenhouse gases may comprise one to five percent of your emissions. Um, that accounting usually comes in just uh, one of two forms, either a, uh, oops, well, let me jump to this one. Um, it's important that the emissions, your, your inventory meets some protocol, some national standard. Uh, for example, ICLE or the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives has been providing such a standard for 30 years, since the late 80s. Um, and they are, they are the standard we use both for the Regional Indicators Initiative and for the work I do in cities. There are generally two kinds of, um, of greenhouse gas uh, inventories or carbon based land assessments. A city operations looks at the greenhouse gases within your own city operations, the basic kind of functions, and then city wide operations looks at, at the emissions that, that are associated with activities within your geographic boundary. The, uh, why are they important? And we've talked about this already, so I can jump over this quickly. Uh, with your Green Step Cities, steps two and three, you have the 170 best practice actions uh, and all kinds of activities to, to improve uh, efficiency, save money, save energy, and also this results in a reduced greenhouse gas footprint. Um, so you need to have uh, the baseline assessment gives you a base year and gives you uh, subsequent years to measure uh, whether you are being effective or not. And as the old line goes, if you, uh, if you don't measure your results, you can't tell success from failure. Um, and also there is this piece that you not only want to see what, how you're performing, uh, but also you have peer cities. And I know cities compete. They compete with one another. Um, and I think uh, somebody made the comment, uh, Sue, if you're going to reduce your emissions by your, your efficiency, by increase efficiency by 30%, is that the new standard? Obviously, we do this. And, and baseline assessments, because of that protocol, there is, you can have an apples to apples comparison among peer cities. And also, um, the state has a very aggressive Next Generation Act. And most people live in cities. So if we can't reduce our carbon footprints uh, in cities, it's not going to happen. Uh, this is the place where it needs to be done. Um, and in fact, measurement seems to be more and more a standard uh, used by both private industry and also uh, local governments. So it may well become um, very likely to become a standard or at least an advantage for state and federal funding for projects. So let's take a look at the um, Citywide uh, greenhouse gas inventory. This is a typical breakout, and the contents uh, are going to include energy consumption of electricity and natural gas, liquid and solid fuels that are, might be part of a district energy system or a combined uh, heat power system. Transportation, the biggest factor is going to be vehicle miles traveled. There are methods to convert the data that we have from uh, the MnDOT provides VMT by roadway for every city in the state uh, and every county, and then there are formulas to translate that into greenhouse gas emissions and energy. <clears throat> Some cities, especially those uh, those cities within the region, will have a one to five percent share of the airport of these emissions associated with the functioning of the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport, and that can be you know fairly significant piece. Um, now for for Greater Minnesota, uh, be much smaller piece for their local airports. And also there's water-based, which is going to be a sliver of, of barge traffic on Mississippi River or on lakes in the case of Superior, or Duluth rather, and, and rail. But they're going to be very, very small. Most cities are not going to count that. It's not required. Solid waste management is, an, as, is a required component of the international protocols, but it usually comprises 1 to 2 percent of the total uh, citywide, uh, citywide footprint. And then finally, um, wastewater treatment will be an even smaller sliver, but it is part of the requires for the, uh, for the international protocol. And then the last piece is water use. And uh, Rick Carter really was initiated this with the Regional Indicators Initiative Project. And he re recognized the importance of water 
uh, increasing importance as we're all looking at our, our aquifers and uh, sustainable use of groundwater. And uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> it brought that aspect in, and we're finding it to be very, very useful to look at how cities uh, produce potable water, sell and, and buy from other cities, how much is, is uh, lost in, 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 the, in the process. So it's not a part of uh, the protocol, but it is an important, it's an increasingly important part in, uh, in, at this time. Laura? How does wastewater treatment not overlap If you, if the uh, city operation side, which I'll come to, if, if you own your wastewater treatment plant, um, then it would come in on that side of the city operations as a city facility. Um, and in terms of the city-wide asses uh, assessment, it's it's something that it gets zeroed back out, so that you would identify the um, uh, Linda Henning at the wastewater treatment plant can give the um, share of that plant's emissions on a per city basis to you, which would go in that category, and then you would zero it out on the on your electricity side. So it's accounted for. There's no double counting. We make sure there's no double counting. It's tricky though. It's a great question. Um, and I'm going to use a little icon in the upper right here when I talk about this, when you see the uh, picture of basically the west side of, uh, of St. Paul, because it's, I'm going to be flipping back and forth between uh, citywide and city operations. So if you get a little lost in my, my conversation, the aerial photograph is, uh, deals with citywide. When I get to City Hall, you'll see Minneapolis City Hall. Um, so what's, in, what's included, you'd have to have a base year and a typically at least two more years to establish some trend analysis for a citywide assessment. Uh, it's important in order, to, especially for trend analysis, to deal with normalizing. And you would normalize uh, as your population changes, or your jobs change, households change, you want to be able to account for that uh, over time. Um, and of course, utilities have changing emission rates. Excel has consistently brought down the greenhouse gas emissions per megawatt produced uh, precipitously. I think they're a leader in the country, in fact. And in order to then um, normalize for that, you have to account for that. Um, of course, temperature, uh, weather can, can affect the heating, the energy for heating and cooling buildings. And then um, finally, precipitation can affect water use. Uh, typically, on a greenhouse gas assessment, you're reporting the data on an Excel energy or Excel uh, data sheets. And then hopefully, you'll have an analytical report that will describe all of this data, provide the analysis, explain the changes. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I'm going to move to city operations, and I'm going to uh, use as my icon to help you identify where we are with beautiful Minneapolis City Hall. For 30 years, I worked in this area of the building. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful building. Um, and that, that's my background, 30 years with the city of Minneapolis as a city planner and environmental management. So we have many of the same sorts of things, building energy consumption, uh, same issues, uh, electricity, natural gas, and so forth. Um, in the case of city operations, you should come and incorporate your buildings as well as uh, that you own, as well as those that are leased. Um, liquid fuels consumption will be primarily associated with public works, the vehicle fleet, generators, and off-road equipment. But also, um, the idea is that there are some basic city functions, uh, roads, seal coating, street uh, sweeping, plowing, and so forth. And many of these services are contracted out, and it's tricky to translate then how those contracts translate back into greenhouse gas emissions because they need to be incorporated as part of your basic city functions. Um, official business travel is pretty easy. The public, the uh, accounting department will know uh, how many miles or at least gallons that have been fuel that's been reimbursed and so forth. And then larger cities uh, will may want to measure employee commute, especially if there's transit service, then they may want to bring that part of the footprint down by offering uh, subsidizing transit for their employees or carpooling services. And um, again, solid waste management is a, is a part of a, of a citywide assessment. There's a quick picture of a, of a typical, I don't I need to go into it all, but that's kind of data you would, you would bring out of that. Another question, Laura? Sure, um, you included waste facilities there, so how are you suggesting that the city get hold of that data? 
repeat that? It's not, oh, the question is that um, how can you include leased facilities if it's not a part of B3? Um, it's, hard to get the data. it's hard to get the data. Exactly right. Um, and in and you put the lease the lease. Uh, the cities I've worked with have gone to the people who have leased and they've given the basic information. Or, uh, at worst case, you can use some standard uh, KBTU per square foot, translate that into, into averages. It, it'll be a smaller part of the footprint, and so therefore will have a smaller effect, uh, have a, a greater range of, of, of error. Okay. Uh, for city operations, it's really important that you have annual data. Um, you, this, 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 is a, this is the area, these are the things under your direct control. And like your city budget, I believe you should be tracking this on an annual basis. In the case of the citywide, I think once you have that base year and a couple of years to look at established trends, you could clearly let that go for every other year or so uh, in order to establish trends. I don't believe you need to have citywide every year. City operations, I do. It's uh, similar to normalizing factors. Um, you could use it per job calculations, for example. Um, and the, this is, this is a, an example for a trend analysis um, where you see with this that the trends will go from 2005 to 2013 for, for this particular city. Um, and it's normalized for weather and utility rates. So you can see the change. Um, and even the second bar is normalized, the first bar is actual. And then for the um, change in facilities, the existing facility emissions would be in blue, and the new uh, the revisions in, in, in uh, gold. So therefore, you can see those uh, how the normalizing can make a big difference. Again, uh, on the best practices uh, versus metrics, the sec my second point. The, we've already talked about this a lot, so I'm going to jump through it really quick. But of course, steps two and three of the Green Step Cities is all focused on best practice actions, 170 uh, actions that are an encyclopedia of what to do. We know what to do. Um, and then we talked about step four as start now measuring those results, and then step five eventually will will take care of, of uh, setting goals and the like. And the baseline assessments are a part of step four. The, I'd like to tell a quick anecdote on this that I like from uh, Rick Carter director of the um, Regional Indicators Initiative Project. He said, if you're, if you're in a room and your job was to, to uh, say, decrease the, the environmental footprint, make it more energy efficient, you could take a best practices approach and say, well, we know if we turn down the thermostat, if we took care of the windows with thermal uh, barriers, if we increased the insulation, we would probably bring, make, make the room more efficient, use less energy. And that would be really great. Another way would be to put a meter in the room that would say, well, we're using less, or we're losing more, and, and, and that would guide you on what to do as well. And, and that would be good, he said, but the best would be if you had both. Then you could really make a difference. And that's what we're talking about here, using both. So let me defend my subtitle. That I believe that a carbon baseline assessment is the energy equivalent of, the, of your city budget, the environmental equivalent of your city budget. And here's a quick list of some basic city responsibilities. City planning, transportation planning, land use planning, uh, the development and the zoning controls that, that implement your plans, the uh, economic, all, most cities will have an economic development tool uh, to, to further uh, their plans, and of course the city operations, the, the various aspects of the city major basic city operations, city responsibilities. And every year there's a, there are budgetary tools that there will be, uh, the city is going to know what the amount of money that comes in. They're going to pay great attention to how that money is going to be spent. And they'll also produce a long range capital improvement program dealing with dollars. That's the thing that brings all this stuff together. They have this common denominator, dollars. In the case of uh, sustainability tools, we have our 170 best practice actions that says if you do these kinds of things, good things will happen. And we also, I'm pushing for the carbon baseline assessment that says let's start measuring those effects as well. 
And the beauty of this is that, or one of the problems is that, that information comes out in kilowatt hours and therms and gallons of uh, fuel and tons of waste. Uh, and what do you, how, do you, how do you mold that together? What's the common denominator? And the beauty of a carbon baseline assessment, it can translate this into a common denominator of greenhouse gas emissions and energy uh, ETUs. So um, in the case of Burnsville, uh, Sue, I kind of stole some of my thunder here <laughs> because it's, it's such a great example. And this was uh, one of the uh, pieces of data that we did for the city of, of Burnsville. And the idea that their water utility uh, had, you know what, you know, you covered this so well. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip through this piece. But you had just phenomenal um, change here that's really worthwhile. Of course, I got to talk about silos, right? <laughs> um, working for 30 years for a city, I know about silos, and all of you do. And I think one of the main benefits of a baseline assessment is that it brings people around <coughs> the table. And um, one city I worked with was, I think there's an interesting piece here is where that individual maybe didn't think climate change was a hoax completely, but it certainly was overblown. Um, but he was at the table. And through this process, uh, he really became uh, an advocate. And when I came back and visited the city a couple years later, uh, he took great pains to walk me around uh, the bu buildings and talk about, we did this, this, and look how this happens. And it was amazing to see that transformation. Uh, he became a climate change enthusiast as a, as a result of this process. So I'm going to move now to the citywide. Um, greenhouse gas assessment side of it, and those are the five pieces we've already talked about, um, and go to my fourth point. Can we change the world? And we all know Paris and Rio and 10 other places before that, that we have to change the world. And I like this quote from Doug Farr, a great textbook called Urban Design of Nature. He said, in truth, the entire built environment gets renewed or rebuilt every few generations. We just have to do it differently. And our goal then is to help cities develop a sustainable future. And the, and the fact is we know what to do. It's typically a political or, or a, a leadership, it, 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 there's social barriers to getting the right thing done. Um, but the question is on a citywide basis, it seems kind of an insurmountable task. How can, how can we as city planners or sustainability officials or whomever uh, move the needle. How do we move the needle? How do you change VMT in your city? Um, and, the, and the fact is that cities have the authority over the, over the two primary factors that affect climate change, um, and that is land use and transportation. Um, the, US, the local government controls land use, and we know what to do in terms of densifying our cities, densifying them in areas that are already redeveloped, not sprawling. A sprawl is probably one of the greatest causes of climate change, at least in this country. The, um, we know how to create more compact, human-scaled environments with uh, mixed use and walkable, walkable uh, streets and transit-oriented development, housing options for families of all income levels. We know how to do this. Um, and this phenomenon, would you drive a car without one? Um, you know, let me back up here before we get to that one. I, uh, like I said, I worked for the city of Minneapolis for 30 years, and about two-thirds through my career, we got a new planning director, and, and he, I believe he had a fundamental change on the city of Minneapolis. This would have been back uh, late 90s, and prior to that time, it seemed that the city was struggling so much um, trying to compete with its with the suburbs by becoming more like a suburb. Uh, new projects would try to be lower density. Uh, the streets were designed to carry as many vehicles as fast as they could to get there to the destinations and provide as much parking as they needed in order to uh, compete with suburbs that have all of those kinds of things. And he came in and said, no, we're never going to be able to compete as a central suburb. We're going to compete as a central city. And he brought the principles of urbanism before, uh, that was just after new urbanism was basically developed. He said, there's old urbanism and it works. And we developed a new comprehensive plan. A couple years later, we basically rewrote the zoning code 
in order to implement that plan and over the next uh, 10, 15 years with, with thousands of incremental changes in, in, as, as permits were done, the city changed. And as a result, the uh, city of Minneapolis is considered one of the most livable cities, uh, progressive cities, and is a leader in terms of sustainability. They have been using uh, indicators, sustainability indicators for, I don't know how many, 10, 15 years by now. Uh, and so they believe in metrics and it's making a difference. Um, this is a surprise, uh, to, real surprise to me on, on like un something out of the blue. Uh, Mother Jones this month has a great article on no parking. And the point is, is that um, that the the um, pre the prediction is that within 15 years we could free up 90% of our parking lots, 90%. And the reason being something that that no one could have anticipated probably is that these on-demand car services, Light and and uh, Uber, um, they don't need parking spaces. Um, they're constantly constantly on the move. We, are, we already have self-driving cars. The future can be self-driving fleets. And 90% of the emissions associated with, um, with vehicles could be eliminated by this. Um, and an example of this sort of a thing right now is, I mean, it's happening in cities around the country anyway. This is Manhattan's High Line, an unused railroad spur right in downtown Manhattan used as a park, reused as a park. So these are, this is an example where technology can surprise us. Um, staying on the city assessments, how do we get there? Uh, what's the imp implementation? How do we implement this sort of a thing? And one great example is ICLEI again. ICLEI has been doing this for 30 years, uh, and they have a, a, a web-based protocol that um, allows you to do a citywide assessment, and it's free to cities to use. Um, it not only has the um, greenhouse gas assessment side to it, there's also a planning, um, assess a, a planning module. So that, and if you are a member of ICLEI, you can also have technical services that go along with it. That's on the good side. It's free and it gives you the numbers. On the, on the downside, it, it doesn't give you that, that uh, an analytical report. You have to do your own analysis with this. Um, of course, the Minnesota B3 program that you're all familiar with is a phenomenal program to track your own data. And all of you, B3, you know, you're already doing it, so I don't need to go into it anymore. But that takes care of your existing building and, and, uh, and a very um, powerful tool that's free to cities. Um, however, that's not enough. That, that alone wouldn't make it uh, protocol compliant. And there's, it doesn't have that city-specific analysis. Um, so there is a third way, and that's the private consultant. And I looked around. There's not that many right now who are doing uh, carbon baseline assessments, but I did find one unabashedly willing to give me all of their data. Uh, and that was me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just to describe the, the, the work I do that others can do as well, but this is, this is I can just describe my own. Uh, like I said, you need at least three years of data uh, to do a city operations assessment. Um, it'll be, it needs to be protocol compliant. You will get a, a city-specific analytical report that evaluates the data. Um, and so you can understand what these things can cost. Um, on average, I estimate about $6,500 to, to provide that for a city. And then you do need annual updates. And um, I was hoping, Sue, that your answer would have been, yes, Michael, I do it every year now. <laughs> but I guess not. Um, it was every year. Every other year, that's wonderful. No, I meant, I meant you yourself, that you took this on. Okay. Um, about 900 bucks for an annual update. Um, and this is the report for the city of Burnsville I've done. And it, it is involved. There's 24 pages of descriptions. This is both citywide and city operations. Uh, there's 26 tables and figures. If you like spreadsheets, um, there's, uh, what, 27 spreadsheets that tell the story. Um, you want to be a... You want some peace and quiet at a party to say, somebody asks you, what do you do? <laughs> I love doing spreadsheets. And it's like, to find somebody else to talk to <laughs> right away. Um, now looking, uh, let's see, and of course, for the citywide assessments, we have the Regional Indicators Initiative Project. And it's fantastic. Seven years of data. Uh, it is protocol compliant. Um, you will get a general analytical report. 
we'll get one specific to your city, but um, the, with your good data, you've got, you've got a leg up on that. And it's really cheap. So $3,500 for a city to join it, um, get all that data, $1,500 a year for annual updates. It's such a good deal because more than half of that cost is subsidized by the project's sponsors. Um, and they have a wonderful website. I hope all of you have visited the website. But in this example, you can see the 23 cities that are currently participating. Uh, and you can click on and get the energy, the CO2, or the costs. Uh, and there's all kinds of normalizing factors that are available as well. It's a very powerful website uh, for not only learning about your own city, but also comparing yourself to your peer cities. Uh, equally clear path again, uh, same answers as before. Um, and then, hey, there's that, there's that private consultant again. Uh, the key thing here is the cost. The average city for, for a citywide would be citywide assessment would be about eight thousand dollars, thousand dollars for an update. I just want to give you a, um, a sense of the cost of these things. So I'm going to go back to this slide again and make one last point, uh, where we're talking about responsibilities and the tools. Um, and then when you when you come all the way through this, from uh, you've done your, your all your best practice actions you're going to do, you've done your carbon baseline assessment, you've got your your emissions and your, your um, energy footprint, um, that can translate into help you create the next tool, your sustainability plan or your climate adaptation or mitigation plan. And then, of course, as in all things in planning, it can inform your city operations and, and uh, affect your city responsibilities in a positive way. So these are the points I've covered. I hope you agree with me and Rick Carter that Best practice actions are wonderful, measurement is fantastic, and the two of them is unbeatable. So thank you very much. We have a little bit of time for questions. Yes, sir. I'm aware of time, but the agenda has me talking for 20 minutes, and if I talk about anything for 20 minutes, it's too long. So, Ross, you want to start? Uh, when I think about the citywide analysis okay. that goes on through the Regional Indicators Initiative, it's hard for me to see the, the levers of change when we're measuring, uh, you know, vehicle miles, average fuel efficiency for things that happen within our city, especially when you draw a box around the city and allocate our roads to us. And and then when it comes to, you know, I, I really like the idea of cutting the fat and providing, you know, assistance and coordination among utility programs for the commercial and industrial side, which uses a majority of the electricity receipts, but when those uh, electrons are going to productive use that you know generally we're measured on you know economic activity and uh, and the you know how well people thrive and the quality of life, uh, I don't see I don't see the levers when we when we look at that regional indicator report. Can you give me a kind of some hints on you know where do I have to look in there to and how do those relate to any uh, land use or planning or transportation? That we make because it's very murky, you know, between the two. Yeah, I'm not absolutely sure I understand your full question, Ross. What I'll say is that is that the uh, you're gonna the the, the data is gonna take some real an, a, analysis once once you get the raw numbers. And if you see a change, you'd have to look what what is happening in your city. For example, you mentioned the the. Uh, uh, commercial industrial side. If there's a if there's a new plant, if there's something new that that helps you to explain why perhaps BMT has gone up, or or energy consumption has gone up, or in, a, uh, in, in the case of uh, say Duluth that has Minnesota Power and that utility has changed its its uh, emission factor significantly, you've got to look for those kinds of connections to explain change. Over the long term, though. Um, that's why I was trying to point out. It's the cities have the have the levers, the key levers, uh, in terms of defining land use. But it takes a decade or more for land use changes to to have an effect on VMT and energy consumption. Density is is what we found. Let me back up a second. I was working with Ickley way back in uh, late 80s. Uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul were part of 13 cities around the world that were doing the first carbon baseline assessments. Um, and they were they were pioneering uh, the protocol, and an, a, a conclusion we found that from cities around the world was that there was a, a, an inverse correlation between density 
and efficiency. The, the higher the density, I'm sorry, de well, cor uh, corollary for uh, energy and efficiency. The, the, you double the density, cities were twice as, e as efficient or had half of the greenhouse gas emissions. There was a direct correlation uh, between that. And that's, and we've known that for a long time. That's where the land use and then how you design your streets uh, can affect VMT by encouraging alternatives. Those are the two big ones. Um, and then, like I said, you can look at the specifics of what's happening in your city. It takes a long time. I think I've given a more generic answer to a, uh, to a more specific question. Is there, uh, Ross, is there a follow-up or? We have more questions. Well, I, I, I would just jump in to say that the, the, um, the beauty of the regional indicators website presentation is that we can look at uh, the 23 or 27, I forget. 23 cities. 23 now. Um, and you can select out, you want to see uh, center cities, you want to see um, second, third green suburbs, you want to see uh, rural cities or a few rural cities. So you can, you can start to look at other, what you think about here cities, and we know that, that some cities at this point are not or not intended to be the density of Minneapolis, but you can compare yourself to those other cities. You can also look at the commercial sector, you can look at the residential sector, and it and I think it allows, because you can just quickly select um, buttons at the bottom, you can look at different charts. I think that it quickly allows you to sort through all this data to highlight, uh, for example, for some cities, the amount of water being used by the residential sector is, is really huge compared to the industrial sector. So it gives you quickly a sense that if I'm going to run a water conservation program, I should really focus on the residential sector, maybe the irrigation, not the commercial sector. So I'll put a finer point on it. Uh, when I look at miles per gallon, uh, thousand gallons used in our, in our utilities or the B3 data for our own facilities internal to the city operation. Yeah. It makes sense. I know how to. I know how to move the numbers. I know how to. What levers I have to throw. I know the decisions that have to be made to start driving towards a more sustainable use in those cases. But when I start to zoom out to the entire city, those levers become. I. I just. I don't even know what to do because it happens over decades, and it happens with a bunch of decisions that are happening external to the city, and decisions that would be. You know, just fine for quality of life and for economic activity that others are doing, uh, and it's it really private parties' relationships with utilities and their conservation programs. How do I get involved, or why do I care? But don't forget that your city shapes public and private action by land use, by zoning code, by development regulations, and and so in terms of uh, parking, travel, those are all totally within the control of the city. I mean, yes, it's true. Efficiency of, of, uh, of vehicles, uh, fuels and fleets are external. Those are state and federal. But in terms of how people move around your city, where development happens, how it happens, those are all, and different cities will make choices. We know people, you know, different cities want a different city. Uh, uh, there's a different culture for every city. So uh, the city of Milan is never going to see more than or but you know the city of Minneapolis used to be four and made a decision to slowly change. So I'm saying there are actually and it's a measure and it's a measurable result. This issue coming up. A new, a new microprocessor production facility could come in. Uh, a really high water user that makes uh, filter membranes could come in. We're going to welcome them in to the city of Edina. Uh, we're going to use our our TIF and land use authority to make sure that they've got beautiful corporate campuses. And in the end, our baseline greenhouse gas number will go up. Uh, maybe per capita, it's going to go down a little bit, right. but per job. Mm -hmm. But we're yeah, and we're going to we're going to welcome those things and we're going to celebrate them. It might go down per job. I, I, yeah, but so if I'm just paying attention to the greenhouse gas number, I mean we can get there right now if we just moved everyone out, stop doing everything. <laughs> but that's not the goal of the city. It's quality of life and living. So I agree. I, agree. I, I think we're going to on the internal stuff. I get it. I love it. Yeah. But on the external stuff, I'm, I'm going to need. To have the pathways and the and the practices described to be better to start to care about that. Uh, so we have a couple itching in the back too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I totally agree with Rob. I really don't like the uh, city operations in North Gas and then the regional And there is a real direct. It's, it's just with 
the city operations, figure that out very quickly, very clear. Um, the regional indicators are you know, it's just a, a lot more difficult. And I think with the um, three step city, you can go through there and there's a very specific, I mean, it's right there, you can figure out the specific steps. So the regional indicators, I think that's what's missing. You need that extra layer in there to go and look and say, okay, if we did this, you know, you know what consequences would come from um, doing something? I agree. Yeah, um, I mean, I've always shared those concerns too. And, and Michael's talking about this got me thinking about it. There was some way to do a metric on city density to overlay on their greenhouse gases. So you had to sense, well, are they five acre, you know, uh, residential units? Are they, you know, sixteenth of an acre? And be able to, to overlay that so that you could get some sense of would a land use decision make a difference? Or not, or, you know, or in what way, how does that? And Laura, we, we, group, we group cities. We try to get uh, peer cities. I also worked on the, on the yeah. Regional Indicators Initiative. And we group cities into a core standalone on the basis of density, uh, inner ring suburbs on the basis of density and geography, and outer ring. So there, there's a, a rough cut that way. And another thing, Ross, I was going to point out too is that I, I made a comment on the, the website, which really seems to be focused on on peer city comparisons, but also each city as a part of that project gets its own data. So it doesn't have an analytical report to make sense of it. That, that's, you know, that's a missing piece. Uh, but you do get all the raw data for, for the seven years for that project as well. Just to follow up on that, I understand that you can put the cities together, but I'm wondering if there is some way to develop an initial metric or a way, a tool that you could use to take those numbers and be able to put in, you know, if you change your density, kind of what impact that might have, be able to show it, you know, some way to be able to get more to what that might take. Good point. Density normalized. Normalizing, right. Yeah. Um, other questions? I guess I sort of underscored the, hold on one second. <laughs> Uh, underscores the importance of, you know, we're all individual cities doing things, but we kind of all need to be doing something, and we need we need the push from the Met Council in the metro area, at least, to be regional. We need to push from the state for the rest of the state to, to have an impact as well, and so it's going to take, you know, these pieces here and there, but it's going to take all of us as well doing things together to really, really see that impact. Um, so I guess my follow-up question, my final question is, in all of your work and your years doing this, is there some kind of hierarchy that you see city taking action to kind of have the biggest impact? Um, way back for the probably 20 years ago for the city of Minneapolis, we had a, a service a, 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 a be the example city. In other words, the city, I'm sorry, city as example. It has to happen in your city first. Ross, you're absolutely right. Pull your own levers first. Um, that, my plug for city. For, for baseline assessments, I really believe that the city operations baseline assessment is, ba is as basic as your city budget. That's my highest priority. The citywide is easier to do, um, and regional indicators gives you all the data you need. I think it's a second priority. And once you get that, that the base data, it doesn't you don't need to be updated every year. So that's a one two. Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. For the remaining time, I think it's the Abby and Philip show. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next slide. Or, I got that. Okay. Um, so what does all of this mean for step four? And what are we measuring? And what are we asking you all to do? Uh, I'll sort of get into it, and then Philip will bring us deeper into each of the metrics, I think. Um, so there's a number of metrics that we've sort of lined up uh, with the help of Michael over the last year or so. Feels like it's been going on forever. <laughs> <laughs> For a while now. Um, and there's different areas, you know, that you're gonna you're gonna choose to measure, and there's different areas that are gonna be 
four measurements are required uh, measurements. And we're going to ask you to input uh, these different metrics into um, a spreadsheet. And so it might be number, how many Energy Star buildings do you have in your community, um, sort of those sorts of things. What are the ratio, um, uh, what's your KVT per square foot, um, and, and various things uh, along those lines. Um, all to give you sort of indication of where you fall, where you stand. Um, sorry, people. Um, all to give you an indication of where you're at with these metrics um, and allow you to set targets to see where you can go um, in these various areas. Uh, so, like I said, uh, there's going to be optional metrics and there's going to be core metrics. And each of these metrics, we've developed uh, guide sheets for them to help sort of walk you through how you are going to to measure that. And it's going to vary by city because metro communities, like I said before, are going to have access to data that non-metro communities don't have. Um, so it's, it's sort of going to be uh, a little bit of playing with for, for a bit. Um, then we're going to have the definition of the metric uh, with that includes data sources, which is going to vary. Uh, and then how you might calculate that, the rationale for, for each of the metrics, um, and then some ideas for step five targets. Uh, and then contact information. Who can you call to get to get the best resources for each of those? Um, and then these are the metrics that we have so far. Um, and there's a lot of them, and there's uh, a lot of great detail that goes into each one of these. And that's where I'm going to step aside and let those dig in. Thank you, Abby. Ab Abby is doing a, a, a beautiful job of uh, sort of quality ch control checking, uh, formatting, sort of taking what we're describing as a metric sheet, which will be between you know one sheet of paper, two sides, sometimes it's three sides or four sides. Um, because what we realized during the pilot program is that um, a green step coordinator in a, in a city is probably not the expert in everything from land use trans, um, uh, transportation, environmental uh, management, economic development. So what we found in some of the, I think all the studies, is that the Green Step Coordinator needed to ask others, and that, and that in itself is, a, is a, uh, an excellent sort of interdepartmental um, uh, exercise of bring everyone around a table, as Michael also pointed out. Uh, but those people need to know, like, why am I measuring this? So we added this rationale, like, why would you care about a particular, what we're calling a metric? And these, um, here are the metric names. There are the specific sort of measures, the data to be gathered. I'll run you through for each of these that we've developed. So there are 20 here. We think this is the final suite. Uh, we've completed 13. We're still working on seven, so we're not Totally there. We also have not. So that's number one. Is that is that on that um, that web page, Better Energy, um, that you get to from the Green Step website, and we'll, and I'll post that. I'll probably post that on the um, home page of the how to get to it on the home page of the um, uh, Green Step website page in the next couple of days. Uh, but so um, we'll be posting as we sort of tighten up and finalize these uh, metrics. But we're not totally there. That's number one. And number two, um, we we also have not totally decided what are those few core metrics. We looked at the what was measured by the pilot cities. Um, since we have combined the, the work that was uh, uh, the guidance manual for the pilot cities was, uh, I think it was like 46 pages that Michael prepared. You know, we're, we're, we're rearranging and sorting um, measures and we're combining some things. So for example, in the uh, for looking at green buildings, so maybe I should let's see. Bill. Oh yeah. Stand further back. Oh stand further back? Um, so we did some combining um, of measures that we think are going to make it logically easier. You'll go to the same person to uh, in some cases gather city operations data and citywide data. So um, in this process we're still um, we're, we're still in the final determination stage of what do we feel should be these core metrics uh, and optional metrics. So short answer, we're not totally there, but it's January. Um, we, we need to put our best foot uh, forward. And also, we're going to be sort of, honestly, as we did during the pilot, sort of 
talking with those step three cities who are aiming to measure and report by May 1st. You know, if you're a little later than May 1st, that'll probably be fine. But every year, as with action reporting, the, um, the uh, League of Minnesota Cities Board sort of wants to see the, where our cities are at, and they meet in about the middle of May in terms of um, making the final determination of cities advancing to step two or three or four. So, so we're aiming for uh, May 1st. Uh, we're putting up information as soon as we get it. Our plan is that cities would uh, We'll have a way to post the spreadsheet of step four metrics. We'll have a way to post that on your city, or I will be able to post it. At this point, you're not able to directly input metric numbers the way you are for city action reports. And that's just a, it's just a sort of a, a lack of IT support that I have. So we'll get there, but it's actually fine that you're, you're going to send, um, you're going to send in a spreadsheet. Um, because again, we're still going to be working this out. You know, are we asking for the right measure in the right way? Um, are we going to find out that really our definition of a metric should really be a little different? We, so, we're, so we're walking also this balance between um, a metric that every city would report that we could like add up across all the cities. I mean, that would be the that would be sort of the institutional goal of an organization like the Pollution Control Agency, where I work. Um, that's sometimes in contrast to what a city needs, which is you want to measure something you care about, your leaders care about, that you're interested enough to measure every year, and you may, different cities may want to measure slightly different things. So we feel like at this point, we have to um, allow some flexibility in what you report. As we see what cities are reporting, you'll get a better sense of what is just a sort of a clear, um, crisp number that every city should report, and where might there be some some variation? So we're still working that out, and that's just sort of I think the reality of making this program work first and foremost for cities to help you advance your sustainability and quality of life agenda. Um, so with that said, I thought I would go through the 13 uh, metrics. Uh, we'll start to post them in the next. Yeah, a week or so. So take a deep breath, and we'll uh, we'll go through the um, what we have now in virtually final form. But I say Abby is sort of going through and uh, doing a better job than I, and sort of editing and quality control and graphics, which matters too. So that there's so um, so we will have we don't have it yet, but we will sort of determine what are those sort of optional metrics. Um, and what are some core metrics? So the first, the first core uh, metrics, and this was, gosh, you know, I mean, we thought about this and did a survey of cities maybe a year and a half or two years ago. It, it, it felt like to us that, especially for uh, a citizen, um, someone looking at the Green Step program, it's like, well, are cities sort of, are they, are cities still sort of hitting that sustainability bar, um, sort of minimums? Uh, um, that whereby cities were recognized at the step three level. So what we're saying is that uh, cities that would be recognized as a step four should continue to do some of the basic sort of core requirements of step three. So we boil them down, the things that are easy to measure. Are you keeping up your B3 data? Do you have a comp plan? In greater metro, not an issue for you all. Legislature through the Met Council requires you to. Greater Minnesota, different city, different uh, status, but uh, having a comp plan that's 10 years or younger. Um, complete streets policy. We've been sort of flexible. Some cities have comp plan direction about complete streets, but what we're saying is that to be recognized as step four, uh, there needs to be a, sort of a clear policy uh, decision by uh, the city council. Um, a pref environmental preferable purchasing policy. Um, that's one where we've definitely found that uh, the guidance we provide and the person, our best practice advisor, has really helped cities, large cities like Rochester, which didn't have a purchasing policy. Um, have a, so we want to make sure that step four cities have a purchasing policy um, and, that there's, and that there's some type of a green team, sort of a, it's more than just you and your lonely self at the green step coordinator. So that's going to be one of those sort of core requirements for step four. 
And then the other ones will be, so that, that's sort of a yes no question. The other ones will be, and we'll sort of go through, and, and I, I would say, as I go through each of these, if anybody has any questions or comments like, I can't believe you've forgotten to measure this or that, uh, speak up. But um, for, this, for this first one, we, this is a city operations one. Uh, it captures a significant amount of the energy um, that cities pay for. Uh, so it's buildings, uh, fleets, and lighting. The lighting is a percent. We, again, the, you know, as we learn uh, in, in cities what's possible and, and as technology changes, for example, we're realizing that cities simply don't need to analyze whether to change out their traffic signals to LED bulbs. I mean, that's just, that's a no-brainer and you're sending out an expensive public works guy, you shouldn't be replacing with incandescent. So we just want to track um, percent in terms of street lights. City vehicles, we broke into diesel gasoline. I think this is one of these areas, if you combine them, makes sense for you, combine them. Um, and then uh, building data that would, and the guidance sheet will be quite specific as to how to go into your B3 system and grab the data for uh, city buildings. Another area, again, thinking about a city as shaping the next generation or two, so the next 50 years of building permits that go out there, the next 50 years of um, uh, incentives, TIF payments, assistance to homeowners, um, it makes sense to track our cities increasing the number of buildings built uh, to be better than the state building standard. The state building standard is, is pretty good, but it also lags uh, the International Building Code. Um, and we know you, we can do better, and it's a way to sort of book annual savings for residents and businesses if those uh, buildings are built better. So just tracking number of buildings and what are they rated under. A few cities like Oakdale, Jen can talk about their generation Generation Oakdale they have their own um, bespoke uh, green building program. We accept uh, we ex we accept that, and it would be simply accounting through building permits. Um, and then uh, sort of green footage is sort of so you've you've permitted you know 150 thousand dollars of new building permits. How many of those square foot are green buildings? Uh, so there are three, okay, now we're skipping, now we're way up to like, number eight. So the land use, you know, the, I mean, I thought Ross was making significant points. Um, sort of what we want to track in terms of land use, we're, we're still kind of working on. There's some national, um, there's some, some national websites where you can grab numbers like a transportation housing, um, sort of combined cost of transportation and housing. To what extent a city can affect that number as opposed to the region affecting it. So we're still sorting out some of those issues. There are issues of density, as I said, a, a small city in western Minnesota. We would never want to be um, at 20, you know, housing units per acre. I mean, that's not that's not the culture. That's not the value. That's not why people move to a small city in western Minnesota. So we want to we want to sort of have some measure around land use and density. Um, and housing value and affordable housing, some measure that makes sense for a small city in western Minnesota and makes sense for Rochester, Duluth, um, uh, Maplewood, Woodbury, St. Paul, so Jennifer. Is there um, like a target number for something like that housing down in the residents to make yourself aware of that you just well? Just, at this point, step four is just to make yourself aware. We, uh, where we have some sense of what would be a, a good number to shoot for, we're going to put that, we have put that in the guidance, but uh, step four is um, we're just, uh, we're all just learning to find the numbers, um, decide if they're the numbers that really matter to us and that we want to report. So um, we're prefiguring the where should we head. So uh, and to give you an example, just to jump ahead, um, um, for drinking water, for example, cities over a thousand need to send to the DNR a drinking water plan. The new plan for drinking water, which we'll show here, um, uh, the 
sort of target is is to have um, seventy five gallons per person per day as a sort of a target to just aim for, and that's what this DNR has sort of researched and looked at. So we'll put that in the guidance for step four, but we're not asking cities to hit that. We're just asking for cities to measure. So jumping to, so here we're really into the um, sort of transportation. So we have three, uh, we've sort of clustered three measures. Um, news, we're looking at new sidewalks. Some cities, again, a small city, I'm thinking of Pine River, um, wants to have and does have sidewalks and it's 10 blocks downtown, you go out of downtown and you've got 100 cars per day. Sidewalks, probably not a, a sensible or needed or necessary. They're sort of, they will report, you know, no new sidewalks every year and that would be fine for them. Uh, uh, a city that has very few sidewalks and is increasing density, probably one sidewalks. We want to track that. Percent of housing, there'll be a few measures as percent of housing or it could be, we think it's easier to calculate percent of housing some cities, you may want to calculate percent of population. Um, it's going to show up. In this case, we picked half a mile of bike route, and the guidance defines a bike route as a um, as a sign, as a marked, as a signed uh, path, as a separated path. Michael, I see from your picture is seating along the bike path. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Abby must have grabbed this. <laughs> must have leather couches. Yeah, really. A walk score is another one of these uh, powerful, interesting, uh, not a perf measures that you can literally go to a, uh, a website and type in an address or your city name for a larger city and get a number. Uh, we explain the pros and cons. We, we think it's a good measure to track. It's the sort of thing that to move, sort of move the number, it might take three years, five years. We think it's a good thing we're throwing it out there. Um, moving from infrastructure in the transportation area to um, sort of the programmatic side, as, as I would say, um, we're thinking counting numbers, so numbers of different ways to get around, uh, cabs, car sharing, uh, dial a ride. Um, I keep on, uh, it's not mile and it's, there's a small green sub city that has a telemedicine center, a way to keep people from driving to Alexandria or Montevideo. Um, does your city, again, this is more a rural Minnesota thing, but counting uh, telecommuting um, centers, various services, bike sharing. And then in working with uh, Minda, we want to just measure does, is your city served by transit? Could be dial a ride, yes, no. Are there fixed routes or what are called in greater Minnesota deviated fixed routes where the bus is a route that will drive a mile around to pick you up? Do you have that? And then this percent of housing within. In this case, we find people will walk generally up to three quarters of a mile to, to get to a bus stop. So that measurement of access. And then finally, again, this is the sort of grabbing uh, data. In this case, it's from the American Community uh, Survey. Uh, I think we need to do a little more refining of just where on um, that census uh, data site you would grab the data, but we're looking at um, uh, mode share of commuters, uh, mode share of city employees, which is we suggest a simple annual survey you would do with uh, your employees. And then jumping to the top, vehicle miles um, traveled per day, some of the regional indicators um, <coughs> and uh, been able to grab data from MnDOT side, and then present a population community and employees community. Um, yeah. Why is the up to 10 miles? Um, um, you know, 10 miles is a 50 minute bicycle ride if you had a reasonable, comfortable way to bicycle. Uh, on a bus, it's maybe 25 minutes on an express bus, maybe 35. It feels like sort of a, a reasonable, I think it's used, I should say actually backing up. A number of these metrics, we've been looking at um, the STAR Community Index Program, National Program. We've been looking at sustainablecommunities.gov, which is a 
government program lead. And if you've been looking at other programs, and 10 miles has popped up a few times, and it sort of makes some intuitive sense. Uh, I think, again, we would be open to a city saying, I want to measure up to 15 miles or 7 miles. I, again, this is one of these areas where I, I think the, the desire to have every city report exactly the same thing with the same metric definition is less important than a city measuring what, it, what makes sense. But 10 miles seems to be a reason. Well, in the sense that in the sense that we know, and again, from from this housing transportation um, website, we know that um, that the the amount of the, the cost of uh, although now it's pretty darn cheap, but the cost of uh, employees commuting if you're commuting 15 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, just knowing that that's that's something we want to reduce because we want to keep money in sort of uh, our residents' uh, pockets. Um, so it's one of those things to track to, to um, especially in, in, in rural Minnesota, these long commutes, um, it helps a city to understand how much commuting goes on. It helps a, a city make decisions about, you know, to what extent do we want to incentivize uh, businesses moving into town such that people can live and work closer. So that's the sort of thinking. I'm wondering if it's all those people who are commuting more because and, you know, 10 miles make, might make sense to break it at 10 miles, but, you know, up to and then, you know, 10 and, or more. Or more. Well, you know, this is one of these issues of, right, you could measure, you could measure cohorts, you could, there, you could multiply the number of me measures, and I think for any particular area, for example, we've not defined the metric for affordable housing, and sort of employment, unemployment, jobs. There, I think cities, especially larger cities, measure dozens of numbers. Um, you're trying to restrict the number of things measured, so we pick this as a sort of a signpost indicator. Thank you. Um, again, I think as cities report back to us, we may hear exactly that. It's like I'm going to measure two other numbers or a different number. Uh, so jumping to um, uh, land use, in particular, uh, sort of green space, where and actually open space has a definite. Uh, it turns out, turns out from the Trust for Public Land and the EPA, open space has a, a definition different. Than we are interested in measure. We're really interested in measuring first off uh, at this top level, sort of percent of total city acres in permeable space, in sort of uh, space that's pervious to. Um, well, it has ecologic functions, cooling, uh, um, you know, green space, uh, wildlife habitat. So um, that's the first measure. Second measure is public space, basically, places where people can go, a couple of their acres, and then uh, ability of people to get to it. And then restricted more is sort of tree canopy, um, fast emerging technologies, remote sensing technologies, uh, several websites. Um, for counting coverage species, and then sort of like sidewalks, we're thinking a city distinctly has the ability to plant new trees beyond simply replacement trees, so that's a, a measure we're suggesting. Uh, stormwater, a huge, as you know, huge regulated area through the uh, MCA. Um, we feel like, in this case, a number between 1 and 100, an index number based on answering questions on the Blue Sky, uh, on the Blue Star uh, City program. We think it actually captures, a, a, it's sort of a synthetic, it's not a direct measurement number, but it, it measures enough activities in the city. We feel it's the best measure of um, sort of better sort of stormwater uh, outcomes in terms of uh, generation of stormwater. Uh, infiltration of stormwater and keeping pollutants out of stormwater and out of groundwater. So that's what we're suggesting. Uh, again, this would be one of these areas where if your city feels like you're really measuring something better, then we're going to be open to that. Uh, similarly, going through these environmental 
metrics, I think we know a little bit more about them because certainly at the PCA, I do, although I don't work, I've never worked in any of these media uh, de departments, but um, mm -hmm. in talking to the PCA and certainly the, the DNR looking at the drinking water plan, um, we pulled out in this case for drinking water, splitting out sort of uh, drinking water sort of use, um, um, peak usage, and then sort of efficiency losses, drinking water system, uh, uh, energy used, dollars used, and then the trend of source water uh, levels. And yeah, and we have sort of a, uh, a, 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 we think a simple way to sort of track and report that trend for drinking water. Uh, wastewater, we're, again, like some of these metrics, we're literally still in conversations with the experts, in this case, the um, Minnesota Technical Assistance Program that's running, they did a workshop last month, and Mintab is running a program with, I think there may be still a few <coughs> cities to participate, um, although in the metro you don't tend to run your own plans, but in Minnesota. So we're working with them, but these measures have changed a little bit, but again, we're just looking at just pure measurement terms of gallons, but um, energy use, um, dollar use, dollars, and then this sort of uh, ratio of a loss that's in infill and infiltration number. Solid waste, uh, you know, also, you know, you know, you think it would be simple, although you all probably know it's not simple, but, you know, we've been measuring solid waste through the SCORE program, or at least counties have been reporting SCORE for 20 years and receiving money for that. Your cities and the metro have been reporting to your county. Greater Minnesota, a different situation, we're going to be getting much better data through a track system where we're tracking hauler, direct hauler numbers, reporting. So we have some guidance and we have a person who can help cities. So we're basically going to say in the metro, call up uh, Peter Sandheim's PCA to get your numbers. But some cities do, when they license haulers, they do ask for numbers. So um, we're going to try to track this. We've thrown in construction demolition waste, municipal operations, since that's something that city can control and can learn about sort of recycling and uh, reuse of demolition waste and, and maybe, you know, shape demolition permits that are issued for private contractors in the city. So these are numbers which in the metro should be easier, greater Minnesota, harder than maybe averages like the regional indicators. Okay, two more. So uh, re renewable energy, again, counting, so just counting sites. Um, counting capacity, so kilowatt hours installed capacity and how much of that total capacity within the city. Again, this would be permits that the city issues or utility data. Uh, and then uh, actual generation or, or pur purchases by the city and uh, sort of community-wide. And then the last one we've defined is, is local food, uh, and we've sort of defined what would you count, farmers markets, uh, community supported agriculture, drop sites, um, um, schools that are consciously purchasing, or nursing homes that are consciously purchasing and uh, serving local foods. We have definition of local food, um, and then this percent of housing within, and then um, fresh fruits and vegetables, there are, there's a, a, a website, it's the old, well, it used to be six code standard industrial classification, makes codes, national industrial classification system. So you can, you can track uh, those grocery stores, which you probably know, or those fresh fruit vegetable sellers, which are, uh, have a code, they report to the federal government, you can go to a website and track that. So again, a way to try to get a little more specific, um, as an example of, trying to make this data collection uh, easier. But for something like local food, I think, uh, depending on the city, depending on the size of the city, uh, if you're a small city, it's going to be really easy. We think it's something uh, to track and measure. At this point, we're, we're just saying it's an issue of uh, sort of opportunity and the measurement will, we think, sort of uncover interest, opportunities, and we gather data and sort of talk as communities and we'll 
then sort of that, what will step five be? My sense of step five should be simply cities would simply report improvement in the, in the numbers. As far as hitting a particular number, um, that's, um, you know, that's going to, I think that's hard to define. Again, a small city, a large city, a rural city, um, a city that has two, dis two distinct parts, you know, a, a dense urban core and very dispersed. Setting one number for all cities for any one of these metrics is not, yeah, not a trivial age of housing stock, you know, it's going to hugely spend. So improvement in one city um, of a small amount is going to be, can be a significant as a city that has so much room to grow that they improve it larger. So, um, so at this point, step four is just gathering that practice and gathering the data and we'll have on the spreadsheet, a way for cities to say, I measured something a little different. And so in the guidance document, we'll put, we'll put some options. I mean, a, a good example would be in the metro area, since metro cities sometimes get money from the Met Council, there are four different ways you can measure the inflow and infiltration number, that sort of leakage into your sewer system of clear water leaking in. There, there are different metrics for measuring that. We just don't, you know, without a real project, we don't know how many cities measure what. So we put those four measures we're suggesting as simply a percent measure, but other people measure, you know, gallons per foot per inch of pipe. You now, if your city does that, we don't want to, you know, report that and we'll learn. It's just, just an example of, you all know, you can sort of go down the rat hole of data and depending on who you talk to in your city, they may have, you know, 20 measures for any one of these metrics. And we're trying to, trying to, to limit the number of things we're asking you for. I just want to correct you. Not yes. all of us can go down the rat hole of data. No, no God. <laughs> not all. No, no, not at all. So that took longer than I thought. Any specific questions, comments? Okay, wait a week and we're going to have Tons, at least 13 of these, 13 of these metrics uh, uh, pages up on the website. So, will all of those, the core ones, the required ones, or just some of them? No, it's just, we've been this, we've been like at this for a year. We, uh, Michael um, proposed what would be core, and in the pilot says what would be core metrics and. Optional because we've done some combining of metrics, we just don't quite know yet. But we we're going to going to get to it as you know as soon as possible. All I can say. So I'm sort of afraid to make this too easy or too hard. You could make them all per metric, but say if you can't come up with a good rationale why, then you can make something besides. And, and that may be the simplest way to do it. Are there any other questions? Um, well, thank you, and I apologize uh, for going two hours to a metrics workshop and hardly having any graphs. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you all for your attention, and we look forward to pushing this step forward. Thank you to Ms. Phillips. Uh, thank you to the cities. Big thanks to Michael Orange. Thank you to Excel. Um, and I guess the next date for the resilience workshop will be rolling out more green sub cities. Uh, so we have Best Practice 29 coming up, which is focused on resilience. Um, and that's going to be February 9th, 9th uh, right here. Same uh -huh. time, same place. Right behind you. Boom. Uh, so I think that's this. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right.